Hi, I'm Miller, and welcome to another Miller's Game Room video. This one is going to be... Well, first off, I've got a new mic, which I'm hoping you can tell the sound quality's gotten a bit better. So I'm making this video to test that, and also to talk about why I'm mostly done with retro game collecting, for the most part. And it's not for the reasons that you probably think, so... Let's get straight into it. I'm going to spit this video into a few portions. The first one, I'm going to talk about my own personal situation a bit and how I feel things and how my tastes have changed a bit in terms of how I play games. And then I'm going to move on to the more systemic, wider circumstances that kind of really helped form this decision and really be like, yeah, I'm going this direction instead with my game collecting and my gaming. So I'm going to start with the, well, the first part, my accessibility needs because as we get older a lot of people their taste in games will change but also how they play them and something I've really found like the past five years or so is I'm really needing more accessibility things like fast travel, turn rewind, easy mode, yes I'm one of those people I don't care what you think, Dark Souls should have an easy mode, and save states and various things like that and it's I'm older, I'm an adult now, I have not as much time for these things, and I get a spell alongside a being neurodivergent as well, where I just don't have the energy to really handle all these really long games, and it involves lots of grinding, or just trying to make sure that I play to the best of my ability and just not get tired, or which feels like a massive chore. Like, I personally don't need things like the accessibility controllers like Xbox and Sony have done. I don't need those. But it's really cool they exist because, you know, maybe down the line I will actually need them. And I will definitely make the most of them. But one thing I found is that both officially released remasters and emulators tend to feature the same accessibility aid to incorporate these things. Like, behind me I've got a bunch of games from all consoles that I've got and collections that are somewhat related to things I'm going to say in this video. And some of these include official remasters such as the Baton Kytos remasters, the Extra Odyssey remasters, even a couple of 3DS games as well and also Vita games, and the things that have these like quality of life features. They're marketed as quality of life features, but they're also accessibility features. And some of these are also, in a way, brought over from emulation. Like, even if you go on Nintendo Switch Online, that has emulation features like save states, but if you also go onto an emulator, like SNES 9X, the 3DS stuff, like Semu, yeah, that's still up, contrary to what people go, you can download that. And Nintendo can't stop you, so go download it. That has things like that, save states, you can speed up the game so it plays faster, and all these things that just make playing games, for me, more possible, especially with these older dated games, like Band Kytos last year, I played, I did a review on that, the, the fast forward feature for the battles made it a lot easier for me, and even the option to just be like, yeah, I'll just kill everyone in one hit of a card to get past the really, the really difficult bosses that I just didn't have time to really fully, like, I knew what I had to do, I just didn't have energy to actually do it, so I just put the card down, like, yeah, let's just put the card down and I can skip this. And in general, this, kind of, this is kind of why I play a lot of remakes and remasters. Like, a lot of my Switch games, they fall in that category. 3DS falls in that category as well, because they have these quality of life features, because companies, like, even Japanese developers, before they really started embracing the full-on accessibility things like colorblind mode the last couple of years, and even Western developers too, they know that these quality of life features sell, so they started putting them in them. And this is why that I've got games like Rain Historia, which has stuff like that as well. SMT, and they have them. There is a market for it. Even things like Unisphere Life Frazier, where the gameplay is completely redone, so it's much better. All of this stuff has accessibility stuff in it, even if it's not the full-on like complex, like actual settings, colorblind controllers and that which I'll be honest, I'm not the most clued up on because again, I don't really need them. But you know, they aren't a bad thing. Remakes and remasters, we do need them, especially when they add accessibility. Like, it's easy to shit on Sony for The Last of Us Part 1 and Part 2 remakes, and trust me, there are a lot of things to shit on Sony about. But these games are not things you shit on them about because these games add accessibility features and make them so much more playable for disabled people. And that's something like that is something like I care about and support even when I don't need them. I mean, as for me, my tastes are changing a bit because I'm looking to think get things like a Steam Deck so I can play through many of these older games but won't get re-released. Or if they are, they have the accessibility and quality of life features via emulation that 
you're just not going to get any original releases because they were made at a different time. Back when it was gaming was more exclusionary. So back when it was exclusionary, it was all like, oh, you have to really tolerate this difficulty setting and you have to tolerate this really slow, monotonous nature. And now it's like, actually, no, you can have it if you want, but here's this feature, so you don't have to. And best of both worlds is to emulate his old stuff, so you can spit through them. And for me, that's kind of like, if I'm going to play a retro game, I'd much rather play it that way when I know these things exist. And it's not to say saying every single older game is like that. Like, Tales of the Abyss, for example, that game was first made in 2005 for Japan. And you can play that now in 2024, and it's not slow at all. It's very well paced, very fast paced. Chrono Trigger is another example. That game is very well designed, still holds up today. There are older games that don't need them, but if you do need them, they're there, and that's what I like about it. And another reason I forgot to mention is that I'm moving to bigger screens to help preserve my eyesight, because looking at screens for too long playing games isn't the best thing to do, and it's not as bad if you're playing a big screen, so that means no more PSP because the screen's really tiny, and get it on the Steam Deck instead. Big screen it is. But there's also some other more serious critiques that aren't just, oh, accessibility, that I kind of want to touch on, which really dive away from the individual stuff and into the more systemic stuff, which I'm going to start with the environment. Yes, yeah, a big serious topic a lot of people know about. Well, in general, not to say related to video games. And this is where I kind of talk about game collecting a bit more as a wider thing, because I do enjoy game collecting, but there's a lot of things that people don't really talk about in like game collecting circles and that is environmental cost of it. And for me, this really shaped my perspective. And well, let's start with what game collecting is. It is a facet of consumerism. If a game's released physically, it's to encourage people to buy it. Even in the days of digital and physical, where there's a split, it's still put physical games out because there is such demand for them, especially for JRPGs. Like NIS America, like they reliably put out physical games. Axies put out physical games reliably for visual novels. Remain the whole last year of the Vita's life, most of the releases that were not limited run games were bloody Otome games. Not that I'm complaining, of course, because I got two of them on the shelf behind me, and those are fucking amazing games, and you should play them, by the way. But, you know, shipping these games, like whether it's a mainstream game or a niche game, does have an environmental cost. Whether that's manufacturing it or distributing it, and doubly so when they're eco waste, which I'll be coming back to. I personally aim when I import, and I am a, a fan of importing, I love importing games, but when I do, I always aim to import in bulk, as in at least three to four things, because that is reducing the impact of, of me basically importing this thing from abroad. And this is doubly so when it comes to things like limited print companies, limited editions and import sites, when they all really, they don't talk about these things. They're like, oh yeah, you can import this thing, but what's the cost of doing so? Whether it's the environment or money, actually, we're not going to talk about it because we will lose money if we tell you that, oh, if you import all this stuff, we will contribute more damage to the environment by encouraging you to buy our stuff. And that's, well, I understand why they do it. And I'm not saying every site's an evil, a very evil site. Like, there are some, there are definitely some good sites that do have an import scene. I buy from them. But it's not really okay to kind of not talk about these things. And especially when it comes to importing, there's nothing like, oh, we should discourage people from importing one game at a time, or have like three to four games before you import them, and it, things like that as well. And also, oh yeah, limited editions, that's another thing as well, where it comes to manufacturing all that stuff as well, which adds to it. And I think there's one thing that a lot of people don't realize when it comes to the environmental cost is that not everything deserves a physical release. Now, this is a massive hot take, Especially if you're in the more diehard collector circles where it's like no physical, no buy, which I'm going to touch a bit on this a little more later as well. However, on the same token, not everything that goes to retail should go to retail. Just like how not everything that should go to limited run games go to limited run games. When other similar limited print companies, the most recent example is the Persona re-releases, Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden. Both games that should have released at retail were instead released via limited run games, which, while it's definitely better than nothing, because Sega themselves admitted that they didn't really have plans to release a physical release. Well, not directly, but it was pretty obvious, especially when it came to Josh's comments on the matter. 
which while I'm glad it exists, after all I have Persona 4, I'm gonna have that soon, and I'm looking forward to having that on my shelf because I love Persona 4. Persona 4 is amazing and you should play it, but it also should have been a retail, and I should be able to walk into a game store and buy it, but I've still bought it from LRG because I want it. And there's an example like that. When it comes to games that should be limited prints, I'm talking about small indie games. And especially code in the box stuff, like it's known as Forksicles in the Switch collecting community as well. That's another name for it. But it's more commonly known as a code in the box, which is basically eco waste. And there's no discussion on the environmental like, damage it causes. And, well, there is some discussion, but nowhere near enough, and especially not by the import sites themselves. And then, of course, we get to the whole eco waste that all these physical games make, especially things that shouldn't be at retail. And this is before touching on the hardware like the PlayStation Portal essentially being eco waste, unless you hack it, which I don't really follow the PS Portal, I've never really cared for it because it's a remote cloud console, but that aside. All of this contributes to environmental breakdown, especially given we're in the climate crisis. What will happen to all these impeditions in games over time, when they'll break down and degrade? This is somewhat talked about in relation to retro games, because obviously these, these things were made in like the 90s and 2000s, even before then. Yeah, they'll break down, there is discussion on that, but there isn't really discussion on what happens now with the games that are coming out now. Especially in the 2010s, the climate crisis is a very well-known topic at this point. There's a whole bunch of more serious stats, which if I remember, I'll have some on the screen. I'm not going to be putting them here in the script because you probably already know what some of them are, but it is kind of a serious thing. You can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. And the same applies to the game industry, which is experiencing a boom in profits, which is largely, well, subsidized by laying people off and the poor working conditions for that's a big fucking deal. And it all ties into the environmental costs and just ordinary people and collectors, they don't really think about it. Like, they don't think about this thing. And as someone who is socially aware of these things, I think about it. And this is something that is important to me. And that is what I, that is a major factor as to why I shape my collecting and what I do. Like, my view is if you're gonna make merchandise or limited editions, your release should contain for example, a full OST, not a marketing sampler, which a lot of them have. An art book should be full and complete. And if you're going to have something extra, a poster, have it be a cloth so that it's not really like... If you unbox it, you don't have all these folds that make it clear that it was made and folded too many times. Although that is something that happens a lot with NS America LEs. Like, have this stuff and be really selective over what you put in your, in your limited editions. If you even make one at all. As in... Not every game deserves an edition. And then you have the merchandise. A lot of visual novels and anime-based stuff, they all get acrylic stands and a ton of merchandise. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous. We don't really get much of it here in the West, but in Japan, it's so obscene. And so over the top. And you see these, these companies will put out this stuff, usually to make some money, because it can be easy money, and that's the big problem. Like. People will buy this shit and not think about the cost of making it. Yes, it may be your favourite character. Yes, you may be a waifu or your husband, though. But it's still plastic and it's still eco-waste. And I don't want any part of that. And if I ever get anything, it'll be because I genuinely want to have it in my collection and it enriches well, me and my collection. And I'm okay foregoing that. A physical representation. And if it's unless it's truly special because it is just plastic and the And also just not as acrylic sands, wall scrolls. Like there's a lot of those as well. I have a couple behind me because again it's curated and but even with Utah Mono and White Hub, which are over here, there are like multiple wall scrolls for those. There's art, pretty much the key art for all the Utah games has had wall scrolls. There's been some fan service-y ones for White Hub and Utah. And you don't need that many wall scrolls, you just fucking don't, and you shouldn't be allowed to make so many different designs, just one or two, and that's it. And this is the part where I come back to high prices, because they really are the cherry on top. And when you combine the whole consumerist culture with the environmental impact and people not realising it, what you have are the price increases. You then have the games all going up in price because people are rushing to buy them, especially after 
the onset of the still ongoing panoramic. Yes, it's still ongoing. Yes, you should still mask up. Even with prices falling a bit since the big peak in 2020, 2021, it's still really expensive. It's still prohibitively inaccessible. Like, spending hundreds of pounds on these old games is just not feasible for many people. For me, it's not really feasible either to spend hundreds of pounds on rare video games that, again, I'm not going to play because it's just not accessible for me. And even so, outside of all that, saving money is really important, especially within a late stage capitalist system where people are increasingly getting less money to spend because rich people and corporations and governments are just siphoning money away from people. All of this is even worse in America. Like, because that's where the worst of the prices are, the worst of the price increases, the worst of the scalping. And again, scalping itself is a symptom of late stage capitalism because people are buying things to resell because they know it's easy money. And I don't entirely blame people for choosing to scalp game consoles and stuff like that because they're trying to survive, but what it does mean is they are exploiting other people who need to buy them, or who want to buy them. Not as bad as landlords though, landlords are bad, which that's definitely off, off topic, but just making that clear. It's like all this obsession with collecting, it just keeps people poor. It's similar to stand culture as well in a lot of ways. Like, people criticise microtransactions for being predatory, which they definitely are, because they are aimed at targeting people, especially neurodivergent people who are prone to gambling addictions, and um, building a minority of whales to sustain their games, which many of which are shutting down after one year because there just isn't interest in all these games anymore, which is a whole different topic as well. But collecting culture is similar, like, you have all these LEs, there's only so many additions you can make, and you just try to get people to buy your stuff. And then the few stuff you do get does get really expensive, and the same applies to even standard editions of rare games, they will get expensive. And even now, like, there are still, like, NIS games and other games from niche companies on the Switch and the PS4, they're all getting expensive now, even within the Switch's life cycle and the PS4's life cycle, because they don't print many and people will, will rush to collect them. It's this kind of thing, it just makes it inaccessible. And all these high prices is... One reason why I rarely get collector editions because they're really expensive and if you miss out, you miss out. Same reason why I prefer to import art books and OSTs directly from Japan because again it's curated and it will be complete. For those who don't know, a lot of games that get art book samplers in the West or soundtrack samplers in the West will often get complete releases in Japan. If you're getting a limited edition, a lot of them will just be samplers over everything that was made, just designed to go to retail and sell to people that way. But in Japan you can buy the full thing separately and again, Sustainable importing, get it that way. And for me, that's that's the best option. And it's also probably cheaper to do that than to just buy all these limited editions and you're getting less for your money anyway. Alongside all of that, collecting retro games is just becoming increasingly more inaccessible. So people have to turn to piracy to play a lot of this stuff, even if they don't want to, or they need accessibility aids to play their games. So a physical version is essentially increasingly redundant. This is definitely the tangent where I really get into the wider ramifications of physical collecting culture and for me this is why I have largely stepped back from it and why I also think a lot of people who are currently really heavily in the physical collecting space should really take a step back to think a bit more about the bigger picture and not just about the games because a lot of the topics and discussion within that space about what the solutions are is actually quite misguided like what's actually caused the problems well, the first one is capitalism, as I've already touched on with some things. And a lot of people talk about the all-digital future and why they believe physical gaming will be protected. Physical games will secure gaming's future. If you keep buying them, companies will still keep making it, which on the surface does make some level of sense in terms of logic. But the other like, part of it is also, oh, but if I make it all digital, I'll either stop playing and stick to current consoles or I'll just pirate everything. Neither of which are actually the solutions because people will still make games and pirates will still... Piracy doesn't solve it. And in reality, the real solutions to these issues, which collecting circles miss, is allowing legal preservation of games in libraries and institutions like that, as well as digital availability elsewhere permanently is key. At the time of this video, the Tales of games that were on the PS3 and the Vita were all delisted around the world and bear in mind, these are first-party Bandai Namco Tales titles, which were available to buy digitally on the PS3 and Vita for a long time now, yet they've never been ported elsewhere. 
So what's happened is these have been shut down and now are inaccessible, but the real solution is not to just pirate them and rely on piracy to play them, or to go after physical copies which at the moment are cheap but will increase in price, especially once the PS3 becomes a console for collectors, which I think it will in the next few years because despite their overall weaker library for RPGs and more niche stuff, there's still lots of noteworthy stuff on there that hasn't been ported and probably won't get ported, especially given, well, it's the PS3, it's hard to develop for. Ideally, Bandai Namco and other developers that should be made to re-release their stuff or make them accessible elsewhere, so having the Tales games that are on the PS3 on PC at the very least, because that's, again, you can future-proof your games on PC and people can buy them legit off Steam and hopefully GOG and other places someday. The other thing with collecting culture that I touched on already is that companies should be restricted by legislation over what they're allowed to actually make, the quantities that they should ma they can make, as well as making it really expensive to do so, like charging extra taxes or plastic. And also for collectors in general and gamers and whatever you want to call people who play games, just accept that advocating for all games to get a physical release is unrealistic and that collecting culture, especially for retro games, is just ridiculous and just needs a huge rethink that's disconnected from what people have been led to believe thanks to both companies and capitalism and just all these other things, especially given the, the real threats facing the world right now due to the fact so much stuff that doesn't need to be made is being made. And I don't think people realise this and that's why I start because when I see the retro market and stuff like that, that is what it represents like people who love games but keep buying stuff but don't realize or think about the consequences of buying stuff and for me when I combine that with my own situation and needs moving a bit somewhat more towards building emulation and that kind of thing so I can complement them is actually better so and talk about it here on my channel in general and just really start to bring attention to this stuff because gaming is great. I still love and want to collect physical games. I have a bunch behind me. I've got a bunch I want to get. Most of what I want to get and will get now, if it's not on the Switch or the Switch 2 whenever that comes out, or even on the 3DS or DS or other consoles where it's still cheap, or even the Vita, because I love the Vita, it will probably be, well, play it on PC first on emulation if I like it, I can then get the physical game if I want to and it's not too expensive because I have the sentimental value required to justify its presence and also the physical prompt so I can talk about it in the video sometime which yeah I did that in my old days which well I'd like to do it again but the lists work just as well. The same also applies to playing digital games more generally. Now for those that know I'm really into visual novels and a lot of visual novels will if they get localised into English will only be localised on PC. They will never come to consoles. If they did come to consoles, they will be Japanese exclusive, like on the PS2, PSP, Sega Saturn, PC88, all those old systems that nobody will collect, and a physical version will be redundant if unless you really want it for your shelf. And even if there are Western physical versions and it's got 18 plus content, guess what? It's only released in 18 plus form. And that basically makes it completely redundant to most people. Because if you if you want to import them outside of the US, you're practically asking for legal trouble, which yeah, don't import them. But they're also becoming niche as well, because that used to be a very big die-hard niche. Whereas in the visual novels, like, it's, that's already a de facto digital-only medium in a lot of ways. And if, for me, like, if I was like, no physical, no buy, only wanted physical VNs, I'd be missing out. And I think a lot of people who like VNs as well, they're already used to playing them digitally, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. After all, on PC, they're all digital anyway, for the most part. But... Even in, well, in Japan, there are some limited editions that get physical releases, so you can import those. I'd be missing out if I ignored PC, if I ignored digital games. Or even fan translations of not just visual novels, which a lot of them on PC have fan patches too, but also on consoles, because there are still quite a few console VNs that haven't been localized or have fan translations, which it would be easy to play a fan translation on PC or on an emulator than it would be to play the game on the native hardware, because it would be... Aside from the fact it's a better experience, it's just a lot easier to work with technically. And even when you get the game and you can use it that way, it's easier. The Vita, you can play it on a console that way with Repatch, it's really easy to do. And there's similar things for other systems as well. So I can have the games together as well when I have them, because again, they're all so expensive to pick up. And they're all games at this point. So not every game that I'll play will be 
bought with the physical game because it's just it's just too much money to get hold of some of this stuff and inaccessible gaming in general for me is also about the experience and the journey rather than destination it's quite similar to traveling whereas if you're traveling from a destination by plane you're going straight from point to point and i think for a lot of people that kind of is what it is we start the game but you just get through it so quickly you get to the end whereas if you're traveling like say via bus and train your trip is about the journey and not just the destination, which a lot of the way if it's for JRPGs and visual novels, especially long ones, that's very much the case as well. And for me, that's the kind of like gaming experience I want to have. Well, including on literal trains and planes as well, because that's a traveling is a good goal of mine too. And obviously you can't travel with a bunch of retro consoles. Well, unless it's a handheld, but that's beside the point. And that's kind of what it is like more pe like gaming is about the, the journey and the destination, not just the destination. And I've started making retrospective videos, which they take a lot of work to do, but ultimately that sums up my experiences a lot. And I think a lot of people would do well to kind of really embrace like judging games as an art form and not just something to be collected and just to passively play through or to just purchase and purchase and purchase and masses your house full of plastic and just not really think about what you consume or well, what you play more to the point consuming is the rhetoric but messed up retro game collecting accessibility and ensuring these games can be played and remembered trumps whether they're physical or not it also trumps like the price people can pay for retro games especially when it's absolutely obscene it's about memories and this is what people i think really need to kind of focus on with games and for me this is why i stop investing in retro games for the most part it's cheaper, it's easier, it's more accessible to just invest in, in an emulation station. How that I want to go moving forward with games. I can really treasure what I do have as well. I've still got plenty of physical games to play through. And even so, there's still lots to do and I can't wait to get involved with it. One thing I will say before I wrap up, because I forgot to mention this earlier, is about how the mix switch does complicate things with physical game collecting. Because those who don't know, with the Nintendo Switch, they each cartridge has a unique identifier and when you put it in the switch nintendo will know that's there and so if you end, if you dump the game and then the rom goes online and you download this rom on play on another switch nintendo if they detect it and the other cartridge on at the same time or another copy they'll ban the accounts which will potentially be a disaster for you switch games which this ironically makes the environmental angle a bit more complicated because do you buy use games and you risk your money being wasted by having your account banned or do you buy new games even if you got to import them so you know for sure that your account won't get banned because it has a different cartridge code and this is something that i don't actually blame nintendo for aside from well designing the switch so badly got hacked within a couple of years and now people can dump this shit which the mix switch at time this video hasn't taken off as massively as enough to be a major problem to physical games but I anticipate in the next couple of years it will start to become a problem. So for me, as someone collecting for the Switch when I want to and starting to build experiences, I will probably end up getting more games new than used just to ensure this doesn't happen, which very much alone does also go, go against what I wanted to with buying used games because buying used games as well is a great way to get around the, the pressures of collecting culture as well. And it's not going to be possible as much with the mix switch and the switch once that becomes a massive problem. So that's something to bear in mind. This video is a bit more rambly than I normally do, but I'm hoping that this test has paid off and I'm looking forward to doing more videos with this style again. I stopped before because the quality was bad and I know people didn't watch them as much and I don't entirely blame you. So here's my investment in making my videos better and not being in front of the screen writing and recording really heavily fixed scripts as much because that's really tiring. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. If this video resonated with you, please like, like, comment, subscribe, share it around if you like it because again, a lot of these topics do need to be talked about more. And also enjoy gaming sustainably and having fun building memories, not just buying shit you're gonna put on your shelf and never play. Well, what I do, consider doing it too. Thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, bye bye!